so now we're trying this a second time. Very bold. Um, and uh, we are, in fact, now live. Beautiful. OK, so uh, welcome, everyone, to the Weights and Biases Salon. I have here today uh, two guests. Uh, who are the co-hosts of UCLA ACM AI student groups podcast, uh, You Belong in AI. Uh, and so we're going to hear from Ava and from Matt a little bit about themselves and about their, uh, their work, their careers, such as they are so far as, uh, as undergraduates. Uh, and then we'll talk uh, a bit more about the podcast, which uh, it's sort of core topic is about, uh, it's, it's an interview podcast, not unlike what we're doing right now, um, with inspiring figures in, uh, in AI, not unlike what we're doing right now, uh, and with a particular focus on representation and inclusion. Um, and uh, so there's, there's some really great discussions. I really have enjoyed uh, listening to the podcast, and I'm really excited to hear from Matt and Ava here today. Yeah, I'm super excited. Yeah, <laughs> Let's get into us. it. I don't know if we can call ourselves like, you know, influential figures in AI, but hopefully one day. <laughs> it did. It said inspiring, and you know, that's a little. That's maybe an easier, an easier goal than influential. Influential is is a tough one. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I guess uh, just to start off, maybe. Um, uh, tell some of our, uh, our our viewers here who might not have seen the uh, the podcast or, or know about y'all UCLA ACMAI. Um, like maybe uh, I guess starting with Matt, uh, how'd you like how'd you become interested in programming and in AI? How'd you sort of get into this field? Yeah, so I think it started in the high school. Um, I don't remember exact moment in time. There's no like epiphany moment that happened, but. I remember like early high school, um, I tried programming once just on my own. It wasn't for me. Um, so, you know, I decided just to take a class like my senior year. And when I took the class, like, I kind of fell in love with it. I was always a math person, um, just very analytical things. And that just kind of seemed to fit my style like when it came to programming. And, you know, when it came to like computer science, um, there's like different fields that I was interested in. I was like interested in like cybersecurity, um, but then I was also interested in AI. And I don't know what about it was it for me with artificial intelligence, but just seeing or just knowing that, you know, I could program something that, um, you know, had like inherent intelligence. I don't know. It just attracted to me. Um, I don't know. There's just something about it that attracted to me. I can't even describe it right now, but I think that's like senior year of high school. That's when it hit for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting that you, uh, that you mentioned that like sort of AI was really what convinced you uh, to, to try it out. Um, Ava, did you have a similar experience? Uh, a little bit. So I, I took my first, like, I had my first CS experience when I was a freshman in high school. And my parents are both engineers. My mom's an electrical, en or sorry, my mom's a software engineer. Um, and so is my uncle. So I kind of took after them. Um, and I, I did really like it. Um, but I didn't think I wanted to major in it in uh, college. Um, I wanted to go down more of a route of electrical engineering, um, like my dad. <laughs> so that's kind of where I got into electrical engineering was just um, doing some other things in high school with it. But I knew I still liked computer science all along, and I wanted to get involved in a computer science field. Um, also, you know, I've been pretty much told all my life artificial intelligence is the future, and you should really get involved in it because, like, it's going to be everything. Um, and it kind of is everything um, already, but... Yeah, I knew I wanted to get involved in AI. I knew I wanted to get involved in, um, you know, CS, even though I am an electrical engineering major. And then, yeah, so that's kind of how I got interested in it. Um, so Nice. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess uh, I actually didn't start programming at all until I was, or well, I did a little bit of MATLAB uh, and R for data analysis when I was uh, when I was in college, but I didn't fully, uh, like really fully start programming until I was already in graduate school. And I had been told that artificial intelligence was this big waste of time that people had like kind of tried and failed at. Um, I remember making fun of one of my uh, friends in college because he was working on AI stuff. And I was like, don't you know that's, a, that's never going to work? Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a, it seems like we've had uh, quite 
quite different paths. A uh, question actually came in uh, from YouTube from uh, Florian Hofstetter, which actually is what a question I wanted to ask soon, which is uh, sort of what parts of AI are you most interested in? Uh, you know, I really like computer vision personally. It's my favorite. It's like maybe best understood, which I like as a math person. Uh, but what about y'all? Yeah, I could take this on first. Um, so actually this all this past year in quarantine, I was trying to like figure out this question on my own because um, I knew I was interested in AI, but you know, there's so many subfields and I didn't know like which one I was interested in. So I kind of like took this past like nine months, just like kind of dabbling in everything and nothing really hit for me until um, I took a graphics class, you know, like last quarter. And I really loved the professor and um, he does research and particularly like um, artificial life and computer graphics. And I'm actually a really visual person. Um, I learned a lot by visualizing. And for me, just like the part of graphics, um, just applying AI to graphics, there's something I could like visually see, you know, I could visually see the results. Um, whereas for like some other machine learning subfields, you know, it's harder to like visually see. It. And, you know, just being able to like um, create like an artificial life character, um, like in a like Unity or Unreal Engine, and just being able to see the results, um, you know, just really like, um, inspired me to like continue pushing on into the subfield. Nice. Yeah, uh, there was actually um, some really, re really cool work came out like maybe last week or earlier this week, very recently um, on like people have been doing GANs for rendering and, and sort of like pushing the envelope with that. But um, uh, yeah, Vlad Koltun at Intel had some really great work uh, that just came out that just like really like uh, like sold me on it. I hadn't been sold on GANs for rendering or even really on neural rendering. I was a little skeptical, uh, but it was really, really impressive results. Uh, so it's an exciting field for sure. So, um, Ava, what I, about you? yeah, so uh, I think first thing that really got me interested in AI and kind of a reason why I joined ACMAI was I took this class in my first quarter of freshman year um, at UCLA and it's called E96C Internet of Things and Embedded Machine Learning. And so we did a bunch of projects with like, you know, I didn't 100% understand what I was doing. It was like an intro course to a very advanced topic, which was embedded machine learning and Internet of Things. But I really liked it. It was pretty cool. So pretty much what we did the entire time was we used this like sensor tile code with like an ARM in it and like using embedded machine learning and Internet of Things technology to pretty much detect movements. Um, and so, you know, you, you would train the machine and then um, and then you would like do different movements and it would be able to detect it based off of the training that you gave it. Um, so, which is pretty much what they do in like VR and stuff um, and like different video games and stuff. And so that's honestly something that I've like really been interested in. I haven't dived too deep in it since I did take that class. But yeah, that's something that I, I actually do really like. And um, I personally don't play video games all that much, but the ones that I have, I do like. And I think that it's really cool to make like really cool sensorial experiences for different people. And I'd love to like get involved in that um, in any way possible when, when I get older. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a cool, definitely a cool domain and and one with a lot of room to, to grow and improve. Um. So you've already touched on this a little bit, um, but I guess there's a lot of kind of divisions in like what kind of careers you might pursue in in AI. And you're definitely, you know, at the stage where you, you are early enough to make these decisions, but you kind of start need to start making those moves. So um, like what are like, are you thinking research or engineering? Are you thinking being an individual contributor who writes code, makes stuff versus being a manager who makes sure a team is able to deliver something? versus being a founder who creates a company, not just the technology, but also the, the like social structures and the money and all these other things. Where, where are you feeling on, on those fronts? Um, I like, that's a good question. I would say, you know, everyone wants to be a founder in, I mean, not everyone, but I feel like, you know, the founder job sounds pretty cool. You know, uh, it's like you get a lot of money and you get to make something from the start but then I like read stories about how stressed Elon Musk was when like Tesla and SpaceX were first starting out and how he like didn't sleep for days and 
like became really depressed for a couple of years and the, you know then that kind of stuff makes me rethink that but um in a perfect world i would love to be a founder um but uh before that i definitely think that i want to go to grad school so um that's kind of where my where my focus is right now um my focus is on just getting to grad school and then after that figuring out what i want to do from there cool yeah i've worked with the grad school found like you know phd founders and with you know uh college dropout founders and, you know, people can make it work no matter what path they take, uh, uh, if they're willing to deal with the, the no sleep and the high responsibility. Yeah. I guess for myself, you, Matt? yeah. So for myself, um, I guess like the past, like few months or so, this is like the question, like I ask myself, like every day, not like every day, but like pretty often, like what path I want to take. Um, cause there's definitely a lot I could take, you know, from where I'm at as a second year, um, you know, there's obviously the path like machine learning engineer that's attractive, you know, work on like um, real world problems. Then there's like also another path, like I would mention about being a founder and, you know, both of them like really attract to me. Um, I, I guess, like I always said, I hope one day I become a founder, but um, I'm really not letting myself push it too hard because if I just push it too hard, you know, I don't want to force anything. Um, I found that like the, the passionate projects that I've been involved with, you know, they've come naturally. And uh, I'm just really just waiting to see like what opportunity comes upon me or like what ideas I come up with, but yeah, not forcing anything and just seeing what happens. Nice. Yeah. I do think uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, you might've gotten the advice that like you should found now, like found when you're 22, uh, you know, drop out of college and found a company. Uh, but I think the advice you'll get nowadays, at least the advice you're going to get from me right now, uh, is that you can found a company when you're 40 something years old, um, you know, if you, uh, if you want to. And uh, a lot of very successful founders are people who've built up a big stable of skills over time. Um, but like I said, lots of people take different paths um, uh, to, to get to that final result. Um, so pivoting a little bit uh, over towards what you're currently working on rather than the exciting future ahead, um, maybe tell us a little bit more about the work. You're both in this outreach group at the, at the, uh, in the AI group at, uh, the, in the ACM club. So maybe break that down for uh, our viewers who are not uh, familiar with the structure of this student group. Yeah, I could take this one really quickly. Um... So yeah, ACM AI, um, or it's like ACM at UCLA. Um, we're probably like the biggest computer science club at our school. And within ACM, there are different subcommittees, um, AI being one of them. There are other subcommittees like Hack, which focuses on like web design or uh, web applications, other ones like cybersecurity. Um, and even like one of our cooler committees is called Design, which creates all the cool designs for all of our committees, like the one I'm using for my background. Um, so yeah, they make great designs, so shout out to them. Um, yeah, we love them so much. But yeah, ACM, it's a, one of the bigger clubs on campus for CS. And, you know, our, our goal is to make like CS learning or learning CS as easy and, you know, as inclusive as possible. Um, we have a lot of workshops across all of our subcommittees. And, you know, we try to reach out to like non-CS majors too, because um, we know programming could be like really useful for a lot of different industries. And, um, we just want to share the love with programming and, um, yeah, that's the best way I could put it. Mm -hmm. Um, ACM, is that like, uh, th that's like a broader organization that's across multiple campuses. So this is, this is like a chapter of a broader, uh, group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's like a couple of different ones. I think UC Riverside just started one and so did UCSD. And so one thing that we've been working on lately, um, so like kind of like there are the subcommittees that Matt talked about and then like overarching is like board, which is like, you know, then it's not as scary as it sounds. They're actually all pretty nice, um, but they are like in charge of like some of like the more broader um, organizational things. So something that they've mm -hmm. been interested in doing is like collaborating with other UC chapters of ACM. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's pretty fun. I'm looking forward to those. I see. And I guess in the in the Zoom era, it's a little bit easier maybe to collaborate across campuses if maybe maybe not quite as fun as the sleepover. Definitely. 
Uh, so the particular thing that the two of you work on with outreach that we're here to nominally discuss today uh, is the um, is the You Belong in AI podcast. Uh, so maybe if you could tell us uh, just a little bit about that uh, about that podcast. Yeah. So the podcast is the main goal of the podcast is to bring. It's an interview style. But the goal is it's mainly centered at, um, you know, high school students, um, college students, anyone who's really interested in AI, you could be like older as well and interested in artificial intelligence. But the whole point is just to, to spread the message that anyone can be in artificial intelligence. Um, I feel like sometimes saying the words artificial intelligence can be a buzzword. And it also can be something that seems super, super complicated. And, you know, there definitely are still barriers to that. And we never deny that in our podcast. But our goal is definitely to inspire everyone who wants to be in it to just try and go for it. Um, and that's like the main goal of our podcast. And so, you know, every every speaker um, has a different story and they all have different like facets of advice and they all have like definitely cool experiences to talk about. And they all just kind of relay that onto the audience. And hopefully, you know, we inspire people to get into AI, give people advice on how to get into AI. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the goal of the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I guess, so what are some of the reasons why you chose uh, or are working with the, this particular podcast format as a form of outreach, right? There's lots of different ways that one can reach out. Uh, do you think there's like particular benefits for the podcast uh, podcast format for the sort of style you're going for or the um, like the mission that you in particular have? Yeah. So one thing that we like about the podcast is that, you know, we could easily distribute it to like whoever we want to distribute it to. And yeah, like sure. It's an interview format. Um, like one of the things like for this season in particular that we're trying to focus on is we really want to get to know who we're interviewing. Um, like how, like the journey, just like you, just the questions like you asked us earlier. Um, we really want to understand like the journey that they took because um, I, we believe that, um, the best way for our audience to resonate with these um, inspiring figures is to realize that, you know, maybe they had the same journey or they were in the same position that I was, you know, in high school. And, you know, if they can see that, if they could relate to that, then, you know, maybe there's a greater chance that they could see themselves in the eye. So just, just that's our main theme. And yeah, like I said earlier, just the podcast, it's easy to distribute and um, just reach out to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the conversational format does seem to work nicely to get people to tell their life stories. Um, like the uh, the episode with Paco Guzman of Facebook AI, who is working on under resourced languages and like you know making NLP, uh, you know, more inclusive. Uh, that uh, you know, he sort of like was like, well, I'm you know, you asked him, I think about his like his high school experience or his college experience, and he was yeah. like, well, let me go back to I was a child growing up in like this place in Mexico and blah, 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 blah. Um, so uh, what are some like sort of moments in these? The, one of the nice things about the sort of conversational format is that you can kind of have these like moments of sort of surprise um, or like serendipity. So were there any moments that were particularly surprising to you or, or, or particularly serendipitous when you were uh, when you were running the podcast and interviewing folks? Um, oh, actually, this is something that I haven't told Matt about, but so the second person that we interviewed, her name was Shinasa. Um, her name is Shinasa. Um, and she goes to Cornell. She's a graduate student at Cornell. She's a PhD candidate. And I was always like, when we were doing the interview, I was like, gosh, she looks familiar. Um, and then one day, like uh, probably two weeks after we filmed the podcast episode, I remembered where I knew her from. In high school, I did a program, an engineering program at Cornell over the summer, and she was one of my counselors. And I remember having a full on conversation with her about her like being a PhD candidate. I was like, oh, my God, you're a PhD candidate. That's so cool. Um, and then like I thought that she would be like much older because she was a PhD candidate. But then I found out on the podcast, she just went straight from undergrad to PhD. So she was actually pretty fairly young. Um, and she also went to Pomona College, which is like an hour away from me. So I don't know. I found that out like 
a week later, like a week after like the podcast was uploaded and everything. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I knew her. Um, and so I think I emailed her and I was like, hey, I remember you from this. This is super random, but like, thanks for coming on the podcast again. <laughs> nice. Did you remember this? Um. I don't remember actually. I have like a, I don't have a very good remem- memory of it, but I don't think that she remembered because I think she would have. Yeah, there was like a bunch of kids there, so she might have not remembered. But I did have like a couple good conversations with her there, which was cool. Yeah, I would guess that the counselors I remember from my robotics camp when I was twelve years old probably do not remember the one particular child like me, but I do remember uh, the uh, the counselor Haji, who uh, was my favorite. You know. Um, so maybe there's an asymmetry there. Uh, yeah. that's interesting. Um, what about like, I guess, you know, we all consume a lot of media or maybe I shouldn't speak for everybody, but lots of us consume lots of media and don't necessarily make it ourselves, right? We don't, we watch more TV shows than we produce. I think I can say that confidently. Uh, so I'm curious if the process of like putting this whole thing together and making it work was uh, like eye-opening or surprising to you in any way about, you know, the either about the world of media production and podcasting or like, you know, uh, more broadly. I guess, um, yeah, I'm I'm one of those people that consume a lot of uh, media, unfortunately. I should, I should like reduce it, but it's okay. But I think just... Just from, yeah, just from experience, um, I had like a general idea of like how it was produced. Um, and just like when I transitioned into like actually like, you know, producing the podcast, um, I think those just by consuming media just like gave me that good idea of how it's produced and it translated over. Uh, it was what I expected. Um, maybe a little bit more on like the pr- post-production because one of the things we do is um, we make clips for our podcast and we post it on YouTube. Um, just so it's more di- digestible. Um, Cause I know a huge podcast can be like an hour and that might not be suitable for a lot of people. So uh, we condense it into clips sometimes. And I thought that was gonna be really quick um, in post-production, but that takes like two hours and yeah, it just adds to it. So I guess one thing that like we're working towards is just to like, uh, just create a schedule or just like um, try to like not make it all over the place, but just try to keep it as structured as possible. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I guess in the process, you 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 brought up the the difficulty and the the time consuming nature of <laughs> post production. Do you have any Do you have any podcast production productivity tips? I've got a few that I've you know carefully crafted over the last year. But um, any any thoughts about that? Have you tried using your computer science skills uh, mm-hmm. to to make this better and faster? I, um, I think Matt, didn't you like make an algorithm to like email out to a bunch of different like teachers across America, like a bunch of high school teachers to email out like our clips? That's, that's true. Um, it wasn't an algorithm exactly, but it was kind of like a custom email list thing. Cause, um, yeah, one of the things that we do is like we email to, um, teachers all around the the U S and sometimes like they email, they have email forms on their website and, that's hard to automate. And so like, mm-hmm. I, I haven't finished it completely. I've almost there, but yeah, just trying to automate like those forms that we have to complete. Um, nice. Yeah, I'm doing our best, but yeah, just like the fact that we're doing it, it makes like reaching out to like hundreds of teachers, like a lot easier rather than just like individually, like emailing all of them. Um, Cause like one thing that we like to do is we like to personalize the emails as much as possible um, so that they just seem more respect, um, like receptive to us. So but yeah, that's that's honestly made like emailing a lot faster. So nice. Yeah. Um, the uh, I think the one thing that's maybe underappreciated, I think, uh, like by people who are sort of outside the world of programming is like how useful, like even being able to sim- like automate a simple form like that is uh, there's a, a pretty well known intro to Python book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python that's like intended for people who have no, like don't have a computer science education, don't have like a strong programming fundamentals to be able to automate away certain parts of their jobs. Uh, And I found like that has been the times that I've been, you know, most grateful for having developed these skills when I see something like I have to email a hundred people and instead of thinking, oh boy, let me like put on the headphones and uh, (laughs) type this all out. Like I think, well, maybe I can, maybe I can automate this. 
yeah and that's that's kind of like why i love programming um you know it helps when you le like least expect it so yeah mm -hmm. um so one thing actually that i liked about the way you structured your uh podcast was you included this nice little segment to break it up called 10 epochs um which is a segment in which the uh the interviewees are asked 10 quick questions and give their quick responses. So I've stolen this idea from you, um, at least for now. You know, if I, if I use it on future episodes, I'll make sure to credit you for this idea. Um, but I've also stolen some of the questions. So I'm, I'm excited to hear your answers to some of the questions that you asked some of your guests. So uh, 10 epochs, here we go. And um, we'll do Ava and then Matt uh, in, in, uh, for each of these questions. All right, uh, so favorite programming language? Um, not Python. <laughs> uh, Ooh, I, Abba, was... I didn't hear you there. I think you might've been on mute. Oh, okay. Um, I said not Python, um, but I'm kidding. Uh, I don't like Python. Um, personally, I'm just gonna say C++ because that's what I've been doing for a long time um, with visual studios and stuff. And yeah, I mean, I think that it's just like, pretty cool and I like learning it because I know a lot of people use it so I'm just gonna say C++ nice Matt yeah I guess for me um it has to be Python I know it's kind of like popular choice but it's what I've used the most and most comfortable with for sure um the you know the combination of Python and C++ together that that duo it's the it's the peanut butter and jelly <laughs> yeah. of machine learning right there um and, you know, I personally thank, uh, thank God every day for the people who like C++ and enjoy <laughs> learning and writing C++. So uh, thanks for that. Um, all right. Uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch? I'm just going to say PyTorch just because that's the only really thing that I've worked with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, for me, I would say PyTorch too. Um, TensorFlow can get too you know, uh, like confusing at times, so. Yeah, PyTorch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, quick interlude. What do you do when you ask this question and then the interviewee just gives an answer that you completely disagree with? I'm not asking because of what's currently <laughs> happening in this interview. I'm just thinking because I think in Chinasa's example or in Chinasa's episode, I think she said uh, she said MATLAB and TensorFlow uh, um, when you had uh, Dr. Lachelle Hatley on. Uh, she said like, uh, she's definitely said TensorFlow. So what's what's going through your head? What are you thinking? I mean, <laughs> yeah, because I know those are coming. Um, it's bound to happen that someone disagrees with me. So I prepare mentally for it just in case that happens, just so I don't like garner like a wild reaction. Um, but yeah, I just prepare for it mentally. Then I actually enjoy when we get different opinions, just so it's like not the same answers every time. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I guess it would be interesting. I don't know how, how much of you um, like sort of dug in with people. I don't know, you know, how much of the conversation that you actually have ends up in the in the podcast. So I'm just curious, have you gotten like the hotter takes from any of your guests on on these questions of program language or or framework? Um, most of what we like, what we say in the podcast is kind of in there. So I don't know, for the 10 epochs, we usually don't like question anything just because we want it like to keep it rolling, I guess. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't know. We just kind of like, we accept their answer and just move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I guess, like you said, um, for me, the one that caught me off guard the most is probably the MATLAB one. Uh, I'm not a fan of MATLAB too much, but I, I just, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, definitely. My eyebrows raised for sure. Cause I had <laughs> some traumatic, like, uh, like it was also my first language, you know, it was what mm -hmm. I first started writing in. And I look back on it and I'm like, man, that was a traumatic experience. <laughs> I sure wish I hadn't written all that MATLAB. Uh, mm -hmm. But different. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. Moving on uh, in 10 epochs. Pre-pandemic hobby. Um, pre if you can even remember that far back. Oh my god, so long ago. <laughs> um, okay, pre-pandemic hobby. Oh god. Um, I I don't know. My pre-pandemic hobby and something that you know lately with the vaccines coming out and everything like that, I've been getting into more lately. But 
hanging out with friends. Like I loved having parties at my house, like almost every weekend, just inviting a group over and like family friends too. just being around a lot of people. That was my hobby. I loved it so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Not to copy Ava, but yeah, I think my first year at college, just being in the dorms and just like having like all your friends, like five feet away from you, like I don't know. That's an experience that like I'll never forget. And unfortunately, we, we haven't been able to do that this year. But yeah, just hanging out with friends, definitely. Mm. I think, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Dr. Hatley said pretty much the same thing, which I think, you know, maybe is not an answer that people would have given for their favorite hobby before the pandemic. But we <laughs> maybe learned that uh, mm. uh, you don't know what you got till it's gone. For sure. sure. Um. All right. What is your favorite computer science class that you have taken? <laughs> um, I have not taken too many computer science classes at UCLA. Ooh, but... you have, you're double E. So I'll accept a double E answer here if you have an electrical engineering class you like. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I'm actually going to say the one that I'm taking right now. Um, ECE3. It's like the intro to electrical engineering course. The professor is just like kind of a meme. He's a he's a cool guy. He's a pretty fun guy. Um, and I also really have a lot of respect for him now because we usually have weekly homeworks that take like a good hour to do every week. Um, and we also have weekly quizzes at 8 a.m. on Mondays and he just canceled them for the rest of the quarter. So I got to say, I love him right now. I'm really into him right now. <laughs> love that class. <laughs> Yeah, then as for me, also I'm taking it right now. Um, I'm taking this class, Artificial Life and Computer Graphics, which I love. And there's What I love about it is that there's like only 20 people in the class and the professor speaks his mind, you know, there's not too many people. He feels really comfortable about it. Um, and that's what I love. And like, he specializes in that research field, which is like really cool. Like he's done a lot of cool papers in the past and um, he explains everything really well and just like, it's really fun. Um, so yeah, I'd have to say that class. Mm -hmm. What is the coolest research, uh, or engineering project that you've seen in the past year, either like something you've done yourself, some friends have done, or like something we'd all know about, you know, like GPT three or something. Um, okay. I'm going to, so I was in a hackathon earlier this year. Um, so I'm going to shout out. Uh, Courtney Gibbons and Brady cannot pronounce his last name, um, but they, um, so the project that I made for that hackathon was actually pretty cool. My friend, um, my friend Raj and I, we made like a, a phone box um, so that, you know, in the pandemic, I feel like we use our phones a lot. So you put your bot, your phone into this box and it only like lets you uh, take it out after a certain amount of time. Um, and it only lets you, or sorry, it only like lets you take it out if like a certain amount of time hasn't elapsed yet. And you're only allowed to take it out a couple of times a day, pretty much. So it's supposed to limit, mm. like, it's like, you know, your phone is like kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, and then, so then, um, but like my friend Courtney and Brady, they made a really cool contraption. It was called the Zoom Stay Clock. And so it was pretty much like a clock that you can put outside your door that links to your computer. Um, so it knows when like your Zoom meetings are for class and it has like a timer that says like how much time left you have in your class so that your parents don't like walk in while you're in Zoom and like barge in and interrupt the class and everything like that. It'll like it'll tell them right there like, OK, I got Zoom for like 35 more minutes. So, yeah, those are the two pretty cool things. I mean, I made one and then, you know, theirs was awesome as well. Um, so, yeah. I could for sure use a Zoom stay clock. You know, sometimes when I'm running the when I'm running this show, I put a little on air sign on my on my door. But it's I'd love to automate that. That'd be huge. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Um, yeah, they did a really good job with it. Mm -hmm. And Man. yeah, for myself, um, I saw this really cool paper. I think it was maybe like five months ago, um, where these. People, these researchers at CMU, they were able to, given any picture, like a picture of like a courtyard or like the front of a building, um, they're able to transform a picture into like a 3D environment, um, which I thought was really cool. And, you know, I'm, I'm interested in graphics. So like, 
just being able to like take a picture and just like being able to transform it into like any 3D environment. Um, I thought that was really awesome. So I'd have to say that one's. Okay. Um, I see. Yeah. So this is, is this the neural radiance fields paper or is this a different, the neural radiance fields was one where you could like take like, you know, a couple of images kind of sparsely around an object and then turn it into a 3D model. Is this like in that line of work or is this something different? I think it's similar. I don't think it was that exact paper, but um, I, I forgot what the paper was called, but it's pretty, pretty similar though. Got it. Yeah, I can't remember where the Nerf, whether the Nerf paper was from CMU or not. I feel like it was from one of the big, like famous CS departments, but mm -hmm. anyway, cool paper, a lot, a lot of exciting stuff in the, in the neural graphics world for sure. Um, hard pivot startup idea what is your billion dollar startup idea that you're sitting on for when you finally decide to pursue your founder dreams i'll give you i'll give you a second to yeah. dredge this up also you know there's concerns about copyright so you <laughs> might need to insert a small bad idea into your good idea so that no one can steal it but yeah okay cool all right uh let me think about it i've definitely thought about this before oh um this isn't a startup idea. I don't know if we could make this into like a corporation, but this is something that I thought about with my boyfriend over the summer that we never actually ended up doing, but I thought it would have been pretty cool at the time, but I don't know. We got busy and stuff and it just didn't work um, with like school starting and everything. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to make this app. I'm not going to go into too many specifics because I kind of have some intention of making it. Um, we wanted to make this app that pretty much it's like a one-stop shop to be able to support any like political issue that you want. So it's an app and it has like a bunch of like different links to um, different types of issues and like ways that you can get involved. So it can provide you with anything from like upcoming rallies in your area to petitions that you can sign to books that you can read to corporations that you can support. That was pretty much our idea. And like, um, especially like in, in May when like of a, a, the Black Lives Matter movement kind of got a little bit more um, intense um, from, you know, everything that was happening at the time. That was definitely something that uh, was on my mind. And um, so I think that's kind of where the idea came from. Those are, those are definitely some choppy waters to wade into as your first, as your first startup idea. But I think, yeah, people could definitely, definitely benefit from better organization tools. Um, actually, I did read some interesting stuff. There's some, uh, like a lot of the, uh, like labor unions that are moving to organize, uh, like, you know, groups that haven't been organized in the past, like service workers, uh, you know, food service workers, things like that, um, have been embracing more digital technology. Um, and so organizing, you know, fight the fight for 15 movement, for example, use a lot of digital organizing. So there's, I think there's a, it's maybe not a billion dollar startup because maybe you can't make a billion dollars helping people. Uh, but, uh, but it's a good startup idea, maybe. And, okay, yeah, for me, um, I'll be straightforward with mine. I've had this on my mind for a while. Um, for me, like for, I see machine learning engineering. I feel like a lot of companies employ machine learning engineers like to help build their product. But I feel like there's less so companies that are just purely based on like machine learning, like consulting, um, specifically for like automation tasks. Um, I feel like there aren't that too many companies that do like, um, you know, automation for like, you know, various industries or various like um, subtasks. And so I think my idea is kind of like building the Oracle, but instead of like so for software, for like machine learning and automation. Um, mm. So that's kind of like my idea. Um, I know there's like still time until like machine learning can like reach that point where it could like automate a lot of different tasks, but that's my idea that I'm aiming for. Nice, ambitious for sure. Yeah. Um, so with uh, with the last of my, I don't think I made it to 10 epochs, but this is gonna be the last of our uh, popcorn epoch questions. Um, what is somebody in, who's somebody in the field of AI who you admire the most? Maybe not the most, maybe there's a bunch of people who are all at roughly the same level, you know, you don't have to worry about offending anybody. I'm going to say Dr. Lachelle Hatley. 
She was honestly amazing. And her story, um, if you haven't like listened to the um if you haven't listened to the podcast yet, I, I recommend giving it a listen. But if you're looking for a more digestible clip on the ACM UCLA YouTube, uh, there is a clip where she talks about uh, pretty much what she did at Google um, and how like right after she talked at Google and, you know, some of her like experience, like she just pretty much talks about, you know, how when she was at Google campus, like working as like a resident for them, she did experience a lot of discrimination and she did feel a little bit left out but she she really toughed it out because she knew that what she was doing was important um and mm. so she was very inspiring and yeah i have to say probably her we'll definitely come back to that after we get matt's answer um so actually i was still my uh answer unfortunately but yeah honestly for some of the reasons i was said of course but um also what like she really inspired me in terms of like teaching um she's a really like personal or like she's really relatable with everything she says. And I, I really love teaching AI and just hearing some of her responses about like how she teaches or how she approaches it um, just really inspires me. So yeah, I'd have to say Lachelle Hatley as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, that, that was a really incredible episode of the podcast, really great interview. Um, and one of the pieces of it, like I'd heard a little bit about that story. So just for folks who haven't heard the uh, heard this episode or weren't there when it was recorded, um, the uh, uh, she was part of like Google did a program where they wanted to like increase their surface area with historically black colleges and universities in the United States. They invited like they invited people over. Um, I think they at one point it was called Howard West um, was like one version of the name of the program. Um, and they ran into serious issues with like discrimination and like casual, basically like casual racism on Google's campus. Uh, Dr. Hadley, of course, gives a much better version of this story than I can give um, in the uh, in the podcast. You should definitely check it out. Um, but one one aspect of the story I didn't know was that the author of the Google Manifesto, mm-hmm. uh, uh, James Damore, was actually like like published it immediately after they left the campus um, and like attended some of their events, which is just like a wild twist. Uh, to this to this story, which I'd never heard anywhere else. Yeah, I couldn't believe it, honestly, as well. Yeah, I our old um, our old outreach director Arjun told us you have to get Lachelle Hat like Dr. Lachelle Hatley on your podcast. Uh, she's amazing, and she has such a cool story. And so mm-hmm. um, I just asked her about it in the interview, and she said it, and like it's like one of those problems that kind of makes you like kind of shaking with anger, I guess. Like, I don't know. I take that stuff super personally. Um, I know like some people like feel for it, but like they don't take it like, like very, very personally. But I just got, I remember I was like super, super shocked, super mad, you know, almost cried. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it can, yeah, it's really you know deeply upsetting, especially the, the I don't know the sort of like disconnective, like thinking and uh, thinking about these problems and working on these problems with people who really get it and know like uh you know how like how serious the problems are, and then sort of I guess I don't know coming across people who are so just like uh yeah ignorant of the issues, so off base, um, uh, yeah, um, I guess. Uh, like on that, uh, on that front, I, like, I really appreciate the, like, work that you're doing to, like, to expose the, like, this, the stories of these people that you're interviewing to a, to a broader audience to create a more inclusive AI community. I'm wondering what you think are some of the, like, most critically important issues that that more inclusive community might resolve, right? Like, what are the problems in AI right now and in the future that creating an inclusive community would help solve? Yeah, I think. Um, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I really think that it become like the main issue is that a lot of models nowadays um, they're really biased, um, especially with like NLP models. And I think just like our community is inclusive, but it's, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's to the extent that it needs to be. Because um, right now we have people of all backgrounds in AI um, that are speaking up, but I think we need more people. 
we need more people from these backgrounds to speak up so that becomes more like prevalent that we need to address these issues. Um, so I think just the, like biases and models and even biases and like data, um, I think that's probably like, the biggest issue. And just like making sure that we're collecting like the right kind of data and like we're collecting like a diverse set of data and like we have people like um, people from like all different types of backgrounds, like reviewing the data, you know, reviewing the models, biases, just making sure that everything's in check. Um, I think that's the most important part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does seem like, you know, the participation, right? Getting more and more people to be like participants and to have like say and stake in these systems is like, you know, um, seems like the only way, like rather than waiting for people, the users of Twitter to discover that the cropping function seems to be racially biased, um, like, you know, that's something that should be picked up in pre-production and could be picked up in pre-production mm -hmm. if we had a more, uh, like a community that was more inclusive and uh, more diverse. Yeah, um, um, I would say, sorry, I, I honestly, Matt kind of said it, but I think that just really quickly, like the biggest thing is like bringing people to the table. Um, I think that it's like quite unfair, like, I don't know, I've just, I've heard like a lot of adults um, when I was in high school, like I, I met a lot of adults that were from like lower income communities that said like, oh, if I was a kid and I knew that engineering was a thing or I knew that computer science was a thing, I would have totally gone involved with it. And I feel like, you know, it's that problem that leads us to have these like ignorant models put out and things that are just completely tone deaf, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, bringing people to the table is really important and raising that awareness can solve a lot of issues for us. Yeah, I uh, I talked with somebody who was building a model that was like a camera to detect distracted driving. Um, so it could tell whether somebody was like paying attention or, or not, whether they were looking at their phone, zoning out. And like they really sold it as, as a safety thing. And I could definitely see the like the like potential safety benefits of something. But like, you know, they the the like final use case was a company was going to pay to install it in the cars of the drivers in their fleet. Um, and I feel like if you had like had enough experience working a like working the sort of job where you have a manager who's like breathing down your neck at all times, um, you know, or if you'd, you know, if you'd worked in, uh, you know, sort of like out there in the, in the trenches more, you would be able to more clearly see the potential, like the like power conflict there, the like ethical issues and the concerns with, you know, enforcing this AI surveillance on, on uh, truck drivers. Yeah. Sure, that's like cool. That's interesting. I haven't heard about that. Um, it's an interesting example. I think Amazon ended up rolling it out um, to like some of their uh, some of their fleets, uh, but um, which and and got like a ton of pushback, like pretty much immediately from the drivers and from people who heard about it. Yeah, to me, um, just like things like that. It takes me back to my English class in high school when we read, you know, 1984. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with that book, but Big Brother mm -hmm. is always watching over you. And um, yeah, it, that's the kind of vibes that it gives me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would definitely say, yeah, it's it's a little, I, I found it interesting, actually, that um, one of your guests, uh, Paco Guzman, I, we mentioned him earlier from Facebook, talked about being like very optimistic about the future of AI and machine learning. And I found that found that kind of surprising because nowadays I kind of associate optimism about machine learning with people who don't care about inclusion and don't care so much about uh, uh, about biases, about, um, you know, how machine learning interacts with existing systems of power. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, um, uh, where are you on the optimism pessimism scale? Uh, you know, between uh, between Paco and me, uh, in what the future of of AI holds for, um, you know, for in, for not just inclusion within our community, but for like designing technologies that are um, beneficial and not harmful. I think that. I, I don't know when I when I think of optimism yeah like there is that undertone of it I'd like to be optimistic I'd like to say that things are going to get better but <laughs> it's 
super sad, like coming to realize like when you're little, you think that everything is going to be fixed when you're older. And now that I'm like turning, I'm becoming an adult. I'm like 19 years old. I'm entering the adult realm. I'm starting to see just like, no, like this is never going to, it's not never going to, it's going to definitely decrease, but it's never going to end. There are always going to be people who just are, you know, racist or prejudiced or biased and don't care. So I'm optimistic in the sense that, you know, it's going to decrease, but I'm pessimistic in the fact that, you know, life is always suffering. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something that I, I've definitely become, begun to realize, but um, I will always work. My, my career goal is to always work to make it inclusive. Um, that's something that like, I, you know, I can like grow up and like work at like a chip company and just, you know, be an electrical engineer, but I do want to do, I do want to have a social impact. I don't want to just be sitting behind a computer designing stuff, even though there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I personally, in terms of my life goals, I want to be involved in a company or in a certain way in my life to be able to like increase the, like, um, this applicability of technology and increase the representation. Mm. Yeah, I guess for myself, um, I don't have a definitive answer to that. I kind of lie in between. I think for me, how I approach like everything I do um, is, you know, I, I approach everything that like, I really want to leave everything like better than it already is. And, you know, kind of like what Ava said, um, I really want to like uplift people, um, especially like people like from diverse backgrounds, including my health. Um, I really want to uplift these people so that like these problems become like less prevalent and, you know, just, just seeing like, like impacts that I've made, I'm not, I haven't made too many, but like small impacts I've made to like uplift people and just like bring people like into like tech or whatever it may be. Um, you know, for me, that's like really satisfying and just like knowing that I'm uplifting people and, you know, at the end of the day, like I can't control the entire world. Um, but what I can control is like, the impact that I have on other people. And for mm -hmm. me, that's like my main goal, just like having a positive impact on other people. And, you know, I understand that I can't change the world, but I'm doing the best I can. Mm -hmm. As I think, uh, keeping, keeping on a slightly maybe tenser or darker note here, a question I wanted to ask you about, since this is something that I think about a lot as, um, somebody who, who, you know, wants to make things better without making them worse, so to speak. Um, like, how do you balance the need for like representation and exposure, uh, like exposure of like people who are out there who don't know about, like, don't know about engineering as a potential career path, don't know about AI. Um, they like, you know, we, we got to get out there and contact them. Um, we want to like, uh, like provide role models, right. Get a hold of the people like, uh, Dr. Hadley, who are these like incredible uh, role models? How do you balance that need with the dangers of like demanding that people provide basically this sort of like unpaid labor to resolve the like um, you know resolve the the like crises of of racism and like cis hetero patriarchy uh, and you know sort of demanding these things out of other people when they've been often burdened in so many other ways. I'm going to quote um, Dr. Hatley here. So she she did run into that issue when she went to Google and she wanted to leave because she's like, it's not my job to make these people not racist. Um, she stuck it out uh, because, you know, it, her friend told her, you know, or like one of her colleagues told her, like, this is this is what we've been like working for. And, you know, props mm -hmm. to her for sticking it out. But obviously I would have understood if she wanted to just go home. Um, and not deal with that. And I think that's something that we, it's a definitely a hard question. And, you know, I, I am a female, so I do run into some issues, but I also understand that like, I, I've had a privi privileged life, have, a, have had a pretty privileged life. I haven't had to run into any, many issues, thankfully, but I know that's not the same for everyone else. So I definitely just don't like to talk about it. Um, like talk about it. Like I do know that or anything like that, but I don't know. I would just say, you know, props to the people who stuck it, who tough it out, like Dr. Hadley and like go through very uncomfortable situations just so that she can like validate some 
someone or, you know, fix a company's issue, but also, you know, props to the people that don't stand for it too. Um, It's Mm -hmm. personal preference. It depends on the person. And I think that the whole point of this thing is like, we need to stop telling them. We need to just stop telling people who are, my belief is that I think we should like, we shouldn't have expectations about like model minorities, for example. Um, I think that they have the right to make the decision based on what they would like to do and how they would like to be represented and never expect them to fix everything for us because it's not their job. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's the oppressor's job, if anything, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was, that was another really great moment. I thought of the, of the interview with uh, Dr. Hadley, where she talked, uh, I think her friend called it the civil rights struggle of our time. Uh, which I thought was very apt. It does seem like there's a lot of like focus and attention converging on the ways uh, like machine learned algorithms are, uh, you know, rolling back the successes of labor rights and civil rights movements of the last century. Um, Matt, any thoughts? Any thoughts about the uh, about the unpaid labor of diversity and equity and inclusion, or um, like tips for how to go, uh, you know, go about minimizing that impact and maximizing the benefit? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a really tough, like, question to answer, but, um, you know, I, th- I think about it a lot, like, for myself, um, and, like, like I always said, like, I understand people that, like, um, you know, do something about it and don't do something about it, um, like, for myself, like, how I view it is, like, you know, if, if someone, like, a minority, like, is able to, like, um, you know, push through all the struggles and get, like, to a good position in life, um, you know, that's what they've been working for um, their entire life. And they've been going through all their struggles. And, um, you know, quite frankly, um, it might be hard for them to, you know, work more than they need to, to help lift, uplift others. But, you know, from what I've seen, um, from my experience, um, those type of people, um, they, they really love, like, who they grew up with or, like, where they grew up with. And I always see them going back to the community that, like, helped uplift them and, that's always really inspiring. And you know, that inspires me to do the same thing. And um, I'm not saying it's like necessarily like bad culture or like, or like, or culture that like, um, I'm not saying it's like something that everyone needs to, needs to follow, but that's what I see most people do. And you know, that's what's inspired me. Got it. Yeah. Um, uh, I think maybe I've been told that well, one, we should probably end on a on a happier note, if if possible. And then also, you're supposed to end uh, videos with a call to action. I don't know if you've come across this, you know, when uh, when learning how to do your media production. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about key steps that you think folks can take to make like our community more representative and more inclusive. Um, so maybe steps for students and professors. Uh, things for engineers, managers, and founders, uh, maybe for broader you know, sort of stakeholders in AI, what they can do, people who are going to be impacted by these systems, which is pretty much everybody, um, and uh, or other you know, non-technical professionals, lawyers, doctors, uh, who like are, uh, maybe can be like allies in this. Um, yeah, any, what are, for any of those groups, what are your thoughts about like key steps that you think they could take? Yeah, I think um, just in terms of like being like up to date on what AI is, um, if you're like part of a different industry, um, I don't really think that there's a need to like learn all the technical stuff about it. Um, but just understand there's like a lot of issues right now, especially with like biases and like machine learning models. And I, yeah, I think the biggest thing to take away is that, you know, AI isn't perfect. There's a lot of things we need to work towards. And the next step towards that is making sure that the people that make these models um, come from a diverse set of backgrounds. And I know we've repeated that so many times, but I can't emphasize that enough. And Mm -hmm. I I just think that the best way to do it is um, for the people that have made it um, to the stage where they are working behind the scenes of AI, um, just sharing their, just sharing their story, how they got there. Um, I I think just sharing stories, humans connect by sharing stories. And if we can inspire others by sharing their story and uplifting other people to make our community more diverse, then I think that's the best foot forward. Mm-hmm. Before we get Ava's answer, um, I would say I was recently 
reading uh, uh, Yeshi Milner, who uh, is the head of Data for Black Lives, released a really, really great uh, sort of like paper, uh, almost a short book at this point, um, about data capitalism uh, that I was reading. And uh, she talks about data washing in it, which is this sort of way that people take what should be decisions that are made by people about who's paid, how much, when, um, and, and then automate them and use the like automation process to hide their bias. Um, so I think what you said about uh, one of the most important things that people outside of our community, what they can do is sort of like learn not to trust AI models a little bit. Don't give them that like sort of uh, objectivity that they automatically, you know, statistics can't be racist or whatever <laughs> um, yeah. attitude, like cut it, cutting that out seems to be a really important uh, step people can take um, to make their, um, to maybe mitigate some of the negative impacts that uh, automation and machine learning can have. So um, I think that my call to action or the advice that I can give is um, if you're in a position where you're teaching someone something or you're giving advice to everyone, don't underlook new inclusive teaching techniques. Um, it can definitely be hard for individuals from an older generation or anyone who's just stubborn, frankly, frankly uh, to like learn a new way to explain things, but don't like be able to change that. I think the way that people learn things have such a profound impact on like whether or not they're going to get into it or something like that. Like if you're a teacher, you already know this, but you literally have the ability to change lives and you probably have one of the most important jobs in society unfortunately I feel like a lot of people don't recognize that but yeah be open to like looking up and researching about new inclusive teaching techniques and also just for anyone in general um reading is super helpful I think that reading uh from the perspective of you know ad again individuals who have taken on the responsibility um who are minorities who have taken that responsibility to try and fix things and stuff like that reading everything, not reading everything, but like reading things that they write and reading their experiences and listening to the stories that Matt talked about are super important. Um, and it just, it makes us empathize with each other a little bit more. I think that in, in general, all these issues come from a lack of empathy um, and, you know, ignorance as well. But I think that if we would just empathize with each other a little bit more, a lot of things would be nicer and easier. And I think the way that you empathize is you learn about people's struggles and you listen to them. Um, and, you know, reading is the best way to listen to people's stories. Yeah, I guess to close us out here, do you have any quick book recommendations or any other media recommendations for these kinds of stories? I know, like, it's it's growing. It's There's a lot more stuff than there was five years ago about this. Um, but, um, you know, it'd be great to know where the what the good ones are. Um, I would say the only ones that I can, like, really think of right now are our old outreach director, Arjun, they write some pretty great articles. Um, Arjun Subramonian, uh, I believe is their last name. I, again, I, I met them online, so I never like had to say their last name, but they write some pretty awesome articles about bias um, and stuff like that. And then also another one of our um, directors at UCLA, her name is Maya Rahman. Uh, she writes some pretty cool articles about bias in Google, especially um, on Medium. Um, it, which is like a, you know, blog website. So she has a pretty cool blog as well. And then um, one book that I read that probably changed the way I think about oppression, like in general, this book, it's very general, has nothing to do with AI, but it's called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And it's a, it's an interesting read. It's definitely a cool read. I, unfortunately, I was only able to get through like the first section of it um, the, because it has a couple of sections, but that that was super interesting for sure. Mm -hmm. um, my that is my one of my siblings' favorite books. Also, they just like absolutely love Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, uh, and also, by the way, I put the names for Arjun and for Maya in the YouTube chat for people uh, who are listening. Um, so if you check that out, you can get their uh, their names. Uh, Matt. Yeah, um, I don't have anything like specific, but. Just for me, um, I already said that I'm a big junkie for content, uh, media content earlier. Um, sometimes 
on YouTube, I just end up like in the YouTube spiral where I keep going through a lot of stuff. But a lot of things I, I watch are about just stories about random people around the world and like from, you know, Europe, third world countries, whatever it may be in different situations. I love learning about people um, and their struggles. And like, it's easy, it's easy to like watch people in their prime and their highlights, like, like most social media is now. But for me, I enjoy, you know, learning about how people live day to day and just the struggles that they face. And ever since I started doing that, you know, maybe six months ago, um, I just become like more empathetic, more understanding of people. And I just think that's the best way to do it, is just learning other people's stories, where they come from. Everyone's different. And just being able to empathize with someone that a complete stranger, because you never know where they came from. Um, I just think that's the best way to approach um, just everyone or just life in general. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'd like to thank, to close this out here, uh, thank both of you for coming on and telling a little bit of your stories uh, in the course of this, uh, of this hour and sharing that with, uh, with our viewers. Uh, hopefully they find them uh, additionally you know, inspiring or they learn a little bit more about how to empathize uh, from, from your stories. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, so much for coming. Uh, I'm going to uh, close out the live stream. Thanks to everybody in the audience and to all the folks watching this later. Um, Check the description of the video for links to some of the things that we